Hi, this is Dan Sullivan, President and Council of Georgist Organizations. Um, once again, our, our uh, broadcast is made possible by support primarily from the Robert Schockenbach Foundation, also from the Foundation for Economic Justice, Common Ground USA, Earth Sharing Associates, and the Henry George Institute. And I'm here with Steve Sh Schafferman. I keep Very getting good. Sheriffman and Schafferman backwards. I don't know why. Um, and uh, Steve has written a book, which I set down somewhere, called Our Future, The Basic Income Plan. Um, he has written several other books, the most recent of which was The Basic Income Imperative. So he's very much focused on basic income. And um, why don't, Steve, why don't you just give, give us a general introduction of what you have in mind and, and we'll take it from there. Thank you, Dan, I'm happy to. And I've been interested in universal basic income uh, since the mid 1980s, long before I even knew the term universal basic income. And in the late 80s and early 90s, I was living in Santa Barbara, California, and hanging out with a couple of Georgists, uh, Jeffrey Smith and Gary Flomenhoft, and who were also interested in basic income. And uh, we talked quite a bit about using uh, land value tax as a primary funding source uh, for the universal basic income. So I wrote a first book about these ideas uh, while I was in a doctoral program in 1998, uh, published it in 98. And uh, because I was in a PhD program, that book was fairly academic. Uh, like most graduate students, I wanted to impress my faculty advisors. And uh, one of them had been a speechwriter in the White House under Jimmy Carter. And one of the things that Keith said when he read that book and in the seminars where we talked about it was that I could make the land value tax arguments much stronger if I presented them more simply and straightforwardly uh, in terms of the benefits. And so that's really been my focus with both my writing about LVT and my writing about basic income is to be very clear and direct and practical. So I did that book in 98. I then moved to Washington, DC two years later and continued to maintain my contacts with the Georgists. Uh, met Alana Hartsock uh, soon thereafter. Uh, um, Gary Flo moved to DC around shortly thereafter, and, or maybe a little bit before I did, and so we were again hanging out here. And um, my thinking has continued to evolve and deepen, and with this new book, Our Future, The Basic Income Plan, uh, I'm really working to build a popular movement to achieve our mutual goals of transforming society so that we can be more just, peaceful, sustainable, democratic. And uh, that's a bit of background and I think we can succeed very soon. And that's my goal. And one of the things um, we talked a little bit before we went on air, so I might repeat some things, but um, one of the things I had talked about was um, the moral hazard argument against basic income, which was that if you give people a if you give people something for nothing, they will they will not work as hard, and um, that to me that's uh, what what my immediate response as a land tax advocate is that the people who are collecting the rent because they're sitting they they have title to pieces of the earth that they're already getting something for nothing. And if, if you fund it with that, you're not increasing the amount of something for nothing. You're not taking anything away from production or from producers, and you're not giving it anything 
to people other than than the people who are are already disenfranchised the the principle is you're entitled to a share of the rent and in lieu of or a share of the earth that everyone has an equal right of access to the earth and in lieu of that everyone has an equal right of to a share of the rent and if you want your share of the earth you can always pay your rent for your share of the earth because the the rent is what your share of the earth costs so it it, it automatically works out and right now the moral hazard is going to um a small amount of title holders who don't just have you know not just homeowners or people with a small amount of land or even most small farmers don't hold more land value than their per capita share they um the people who hold lots of land value um are getting something for nothing and so yes so to me it's it's not a some it's not a new something for nothing it's taking away f from people who are getting something for nothing and giving it to people who are not getting something for nothing they're getting something as compensation and this is tom Paine's argument yes, that it is you're being compensated from the earth being taken away from you and if you well, and you would be a productive person if you had your share of the earth you know that's so. exactly right and that's the point that i emphasize and you live in pennsylvania which is uh called a commonwealth uh several other states are uh, and i think that's a wonderful concept that the earth belongs to everyone uh the well, dc with statehood pennsylvania, with pennsylvania that was william penn's yes concept. that was mm -hmm. his very direct um notion is is that uh that everyone that the the earth is there for everyone to benefit it was thomas paine's idea also of course in agrarian justice and i think it's a concept that ought to be emphasized much more and it's one of the core arguments i make in the book is that when people put up a fence and claim exclusive ownership of some bit of land or when people um, are mining or harvesting timber or enclosing the commons in any way, they should pay a rent or a tax to everyone else, including future generations. And so one of the ways that I present the land value tax is I put it in a larger perspective and call it taxes on takings. So taxes on whatever we take from society, whatever we take from nature, whatever we take from future generations, uh, people should pay for. And with that larger frame, I also include uh, carbon taxes and the possibility of taxes on uh, pollution and whatever pe is done that might degrade the commons. I was about to say that one of the things that I particularly like in the DC statehood movement is that in the last year and a half, uh, people have agreed that when we get statehood, hopefully next year under a Biden administration, uh, DC will be Washington Douglas Commonwealth. So we retain DC and we have that term Commonwealth in the name and we honor Frederick Douglass. But again, the concept of Commonwealth, I think, is a very important one and ought to get much more attention than it does. Well, I'm, I'm trying to remember the fellow's name, but the guy who was the leader of the D.C. statehood party um, came to Pittsburgh with Walt Rybeck um, many years, decades ago, and uh, was very much in, interested in land value tax to fund D.C. And... Um, I quipped that uh, Harry Brown was the Libertarian Party candidate for president, and Harry Brown said, statehood, give them nationhood. And this guy immediately said, we'll take it. Because yep, absolutely. what he wanted for statehood, he did not want representation in Congress. He wanted, he wanted basically home rule. He wanted more, more power over D.C., um, over DC's internal management that that 
Congress is basically treating um, DC's local government like like a stepchild that that is not old enough to govern itself yet. And there's some uh, legitimate argu- true. there's some yeah. legitimate arguments for that because um, because DC being the national capital, they they did not want the national capital to be beholden to a local government. That was the original concept. But apparently Congress has given lots and lots of tax exemptions to organizations that had they been in uh, like the, um, what's the retirees, the, it's, it was originally a retired teachers organization. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the big organization <laughs> for retired people, AARP. And um, they gave them a tax exemption on their property. And they would not have, they're a lobbying group. They would not have a tax right. exemption if they were in Harrisburg or Albany, New York, or any other state capitals. But Congress decided to pander to them at the expense of DC. And that- but There is a lot of that. And those are some of the issues that we will rapidly address with statehood, which again, <laughs> could happen next year. And in any case is something of an aside from the issues that we're here to discuss about land value tax and basic income. Uh, before we went live, uh, I was saying that one of the reasons for us to really support each other is that basic income is really having a moment. Uh, the issue is getting a great deal of attention, thanks partly to Andrew Yang's campaign, thanks uh, sadly partly to the pandemic and the perceived value of distributing emergency basic income to working folks who are becoming unemployed and threatened with eviction. And so basic income is getting a great deal of attention from serious politicians, um, mostly Democrats right now, but also Greens and Independents and Libertarians. And uh, I hope that all the people on this call and the organizations and groups you're involved with will see the benefits of allying our two causes and working together to further both. Yeah, and I think, I think a lot of people in the basic income movement like land value tax. Um, yes, they like it, but most of them don't fully understand it. And that's one of my goals with the book is to educate basic income activists about it and just how powerful it really can be, especially empowering local governments and local political activity. Yeah, and, and I see it as, you know, there are variants of it that are pragmatically beneficial to us. Like, if we, like, if we want to replace wage tax with property tax or with land value tax, um, the people who are of working age benefit and the people who mm-hmm. are retired pay more. Well, if you said, well, we're going to at least give a basic income to people over 65. And we can even make that a local option that you have a local, you know, your local, your locality, if it increases land value tax, has an option of giving a per capita grant to people over 65 so that in the aggregate, they will pay less. They will, the, the ones with the biggest pieces of land will still pay more. The renters and the, the ones who are living in poor neighborhoods or on modest pieces of land will pay less. In the aggregate, they'll pay the same. And that's a small dose of basic income used to solve a practical problem, which is that replacing wage tax with land value tax is right, but you get the poor old widow argument every time you you propose it, and uh, and basic income has that that ability with lots of things. Um, we had um, <clears throat> somebody from the Citizens Climate Lobby speak um, a couple times, two different people, but the point was the Citizens Climate Lobby wants to levy a carbon tax. And, yes. 
and people can argue about whether carbon is, you know, CO2 in the atmosphere is a good thing or a bad thing or whatever. But the science aside, the rationale for saying, you know, the, ar the big argument against it was... If well, we let me jump you, in and yeah. say, as I alluded to before, I'm, one of the things that I do is I use the term taxes on takings. And so I join the land value tax with carbon taxes, with all ta with taxes on everything that people take from nature. And by moving them into this larger category and presenting it as just simple common sense, uh, citing Thomas Paine and Henry George and others, yeah. I think can generate greater political will to achieve that. Now, getting back to the Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, and I've been to some of their national meetings. One of the advantages of living in D.C., uh, they, when they were having their national meetings in person, they were at the hotel just up the street from me. And their bill, which is getting some bipartisan support in Congress, uh, does call for a tax and dividend. So they introduce the tax and they rebate a significant portion of the money in order to make it politically uh, feasible. The argument that I have had with leaders in the citizens climate lobby is that they ought to talk much more about the dividend and that basic income in effect is dividend first. Give people the basic income first and I think then it will be relatively simple and straightforward have conversations about carbon tax and land value tax and many other reforms that are long overdue but have been thwarted by status quo political interests. Yeah, and if you're if you're using a per capita share of if 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 the products you buy are creating a per capita share of CO2 or less then you're not paying a tax, period. Your dividend is equal to any hidden costs in the products you buy that had to pay a tax. Yeah. So anyone who, um, if you turn down your thermostat and put on a sweater in the winter time, um, then, then you're, not getting a, you're not getting a tax at all. You're getting a, a, a return. Right, and so it creates immediate direct incentives for people to be more thoughtful and responsible about our consumption uh, with regard to fossil fuels and more generally for land developers and uh, urban planners to think much more about how we use nature and how we can use nature more responsibly and how uh, we can leave more of nature to nature, leave more of the land and the forests and the rivers for natural purposes instead of uh, seeking to exploit them. And my background is in philosophy. And so one of the things I learned early on and that I'm very rigorous about in writing this book is avoiding words like resources. And we don't think about it, but the word resources implies that nature is just there for us to use as a source for our well-being, our wealth, our economic development. And so I always refer to nature. Uh, similarly, the word infrastructure, and it's so common in current discourse, uh, the word infrastructure was only coined and became uh, popular in the 1980s. In fact, in the early 1980s, when the word was first being used, it, the New York Times and the Washington Post and other mainstream outlets put quotes around it. And something that I like to ask of uh, liberal Democrats when I meet them is, do you know what the word term was before infrastructure? And many people, even prominent folks in think tanks and on Capitol Hill have to pause and think about it for a while and only about half of them. I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> Public works. Oh, okay. And public works and public assets were the common terms for roads and sewers and such. And what happened during the 1980s is that there was a general denigrating of the concept of public. 
and the idea that we should privatize nature and we should privatize a government and uh, privatize healthcare. And so again, throughout the book, I'm demonstrating and uh, hopefully indirectly teaching people to be much more careful about our language and much more thoughtful in the policies we promote and uh, how we promote them. Yeah, I, 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 when I think about it, I think public works always had a much broader definition in my mind than infrastructure in that, you know, we've had like building professional sports stadiums is, is public works, but I've actually heard people talk no, about building, building professional, professional sports stadiums is corporate welfare. Of building professional stadiums is subsidizing the team owners. But I've heard them, I've heard them uh, call, call uh, Pittsburgh's um, Heinz Field infrastructure. And it's, no, it's yeah. not. Infra, infra means between. And so to me, infrastructure was a very good term because it meant all the things that are between all the private properties that keep them connected. So to me, infrastructure is water, sewer, streets, roads. Um, yeah, the things that directly benefit the public and that the public should products. have control over and should pay for. Yeah. And that the private developers should pay for through their taxes and fees and such. Yeah. Well, until and that recently, the public should not be subsidizing the private developers mm -hmm. directly or indirectly. Well, the tradition used to be that the private developers had to pay for the streets. In other words, the private developer would get a plan on the suburban fringe and he wouldn't just build the houses. He built the streets, he built the sewers, he put in the water lines and then the, the municipality would inspect them. And if he, if he did it to, to code, then they would assume maintenance costs. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the idea was that the property taxes would cover the maintenance costs so that the new development was not a burden on the, on the community. And since we went away from real estate taxes, what happens is if poor people move into a community, they don't generate enough um, wage taxes to cover their costs. So now you look at these communities that have moved away from real estate taxes and they're all bending over backwards to get rich people in and push poor people yeah. out. And it just becomes a vicious cycle of directly or indirectly subsidizing the richer people. Yeah. And that, again, is one of my strong arguments for universal basic income, is give money directly to everyone, and then uh, working people and poor people will have the resources to invest in their communities and to invest in their homes, and uh, that real estate developers and such will want to build homes that working people can afford and that the working people who live in those communities will be more likely to be active as citizens and to demand that developers pay their share of the costs and we can have something much more like a true democracy. Okay. I, got, I, I got some questions coming up I'll j jump into. Um, the um, I got someone saying granting granting uh, statehood to DC is a conflict of interest, <laughs> and um, other than granting statehood to a city that's convenient to them, um, he basically does not like. Um, does not like the DC statehood thing. Well, um, that's an as again, that's an aside from our core issues. Yeah. And there is a partisan aspect to it in that the DC would be would be Democrat. I mean, it would be overwhelmingly yeah. Democrat. So, so it, it automatically creates a partisan issue, whether yes. or not it's a legitimate proposal. It's just yes, Republicans are all going to be against it. The Democrats are going to be for it. And that's Sure, but that uh, perhaps will change over time and uh, DC might become more libertarian and might become more, I'm here in DC, there are a lot of people who are nationally known as Republicans and conservatives, 
uh, who are registered with the Democratic Party because that's where all the local politics are. Um, yeah. And again, that might change over time. And uh, some of my arguments are that with basic income, I think we'll see a whole range of political reforms. Uh, and in chapter 10 of the book, I use the structure of the preamble to the Constitution uh, to summarize many of the benefits of universal basic income. And of course, the first key phrase in the preamble is to form a more perfect union. So there I summarize a lot of the issues about democracy reform, ranked choice voting, ending gerrymandering, getting money out of politics, and so on, and say that with the basic income, when everyone has the more direct interest in being active citizens, these reforms are possible. And I think the politics in DC might over time change so that it's not a totally democratic run city. Because I'm strongly against one party politics anywhere in any form. Um, I got a comment that, uh, Carbon tax means big polluters will be able to pollute more and charge the poor people for it. Um, economics tells me this, that they're already charging the poor people what they can get away with. And so they would have, in order to charge the poor people more for it, they would have to pollute less. The supply and demand, you can't, you can't uh, force up the price unless you curtail the supply. So carbon tax might mean that they'll charge poor people more for it, but if the money is going to a basic income, um, I don't know how they would charge the poor people more than... Um, yeah, I don't follow the reasoning there. And what I'm saying with the basic income, with the carbon tax, and again, this parallels my thinking about land value tax, is that we should assess the tax at the source. So it's not simply a carbon tax that's added at the gas pump, but it's when you first remove the fossil fuels from the ground, or when you first bring them in on a ship or a tanker. Uh, so that the prices go up and people have incentives to consume less. Uh, this is not a panacea. We will still, in many ways, need regulations to remove the political power and influence from the fossil fuel producers. Uh, but again, I don't quite follow the logic of that questioner. And I hope he or she will read my book. And if you want, contact me and we'll continue this specific aspect of the discussion. Um, Ed Dodson writes, um, you likely have dealt with one issue that comes up frequently that a basic income supplement will increase the demand side of housing. In other words, people have more money to rent or buy. Without increasing the supply side, this counterproductive outcome can be solved in the short run by increasing the supply of subsidized housing units. In the long run, I assume you agree that LVT is the solution to this problem. Yes, I agree. And in the short run, local governments may need to subsidize the construction of more uh, inexpensive housing units. But uh, again, one of the arguments that I make uh, specifically about gentrification in urban areas, uh, like here in DC, uh, where gentrification has been a huge problem, is that if you provide residents of every community with a basic income, then maybe an extended family will pool their basic income to buy the house that one of them is living in and they'll be slightly crowded for a few years while they save their money to uh, build on an added apartment or to uh, buy a second home. Or, and again, a lot of these issues have to be addressed locally and will be, and basic income is a starting place to make those changes. Uh, one other aspect of the answer to Ed's question, uh, there's a lot of vacant housing. There are a lot of people who own second homes uh, in places like New York City, and I'm sure here in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere, there are a lot of very wealthy people who buy homes for investment purposes and leave them empty. And with a basic income and a land value tax, 
I think those properties will more rapidly come onto the market because the rich won't want to hold on to them in the same way. So again, there are short-term imbalances which added raises and those will be resolved over time. Uh, another point that I make is that local governments should be able to subsidize the supplement, the basic income amount. So if the national basic income is $500 or $1,000, well, in places where land value is high, uh, $500 is, may not be enough for the housing that you want. And people might decide, you know, I'd rather move out to rural Pennsylvania or rural Kentucky or uh, wherever, and then lobby the local government in that rural community to install high-speed broadband, and I can just work remotely. Well, the business interests in Washington, D.C., or in Manhattan, or Brooklyn, or elsewhere, um, an incentive to supplement the land value, to supplement the basic income, to keep their customers from moving away. Uh, one of the points that I was happy to discover as there was a recent study by the Federal Housing Administration uh, showing land value discrepancies. And that land in Brooklyn and Manhattan is worth 7,500 times as much as land in rural areas. And uh, that ought to be taxed and that some of that money returned to local governments. And yeah, so I study I've, it. Notes. I tell people that uh, a square yard of prime Manhattan land, like near Wall Street, is worth more than an acre of New York State farmland. Yeah. And, and that if you own a parking space in Manhattan, you are necessarily a millionaire. That a parking space worth of land is worth over a million dollars in, in the better parts of Manhattan. So um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how this would be phased in because I see basic income groups um, having fantasies of it suddenly becoming a super sufficient, everybody's gonna get $1,000 a month, which means if you have, um, you know, if it's a husband and wife and two kids, they're gonna get, um, Four thousand dollars a month. They're going to, they're going to get enough to live on that they don't have to work, and I, I don't see that as realistic. I see it as, let's let's start with a hundred dollars a month, yeah. and and, you know, when people see that the earth doesn't come to us an end because you've done a hundred dollars a month, that that actually th things start to get better, and yeah, maybe. And Maybe exactly. when, as you phase, as you add a hundred dollars a month, you can lower welfare payments by fifty dollars a month or something, so that right. so that you're gradually transitioning this in, and there is a natural amount where, as you do this, rents will come down a little bit, and and your income is going up. That's not the only benefit. If you're funding this from a land value tax the supply of housing will gradually increase. Ed's, Ed's answer of short run versus long run is only if you do it immediately, which is why right. Henry George said even with land value tax, it would be phased in. There is no- yeah, so That's one of my strong arguments with the basic income folks is that any amount, any version or variation is moving us in a healthy direction. So even if it's $100 a month or $200 a month, as long as we're sensible about cutting welfare and other programs, uh, one of the points that I always emphasize is that with a basic income, it totally eliminates the common rationale for corporate welfare. Uh, government should not be interfering in the market to create jobs for anyone. It should be providing us with a basic income so that people have a solid floor uh, to manage for themselves while they create jobs for themselves, whether it's entrepreneurs or uh, 
and people should have the freedom to be full-time parents or political activists. Uh, another point related to this, uh, you came down to DC a year and a half ago for a libertarian conference where you were at a booth talking about Henry George. Yeah. And when I was visiting that conference early on, uh, one of the people who also had a booth was Steve Forbes from Forbes Magazine. And Forbes wrote a book a few years ago uh, calling for a negative income tax, which was proposed by Milton Friedman in uh, 1962, and negative income tax was his version of a basic income. Uh, so I saw Forbes standing by himself early on, and I thought through how to phrase my question in a way that uh, might really gain his interest. And so I then approached him and said, Mr. Forbes, I'm familiar with your book on the negative income, on the, excuse yeah. me, yeah. the flat tax. Uh, Forbes' book was calling for the flat income tax. And uh, so Mr. Forbes, I saw your book on the flat tax and I wonder if you've also thought about the negative income tax, which Friedman endorsed in the same book. And Forbes immediately said, oh no, I'm against that. I then showed him uh, four charts that I have in this book. And I said, but if you combine the flat tax that you're so strongly support and have written about with a negative income tax, the net effect is fair and simple and inclusive and perhaps most important for your purposes, endorsing the negative income tax is probably the only way to generate political support for the flat tax that you want. And so I showed Forbes the book and the four charts, and he looked at it for 30 seconds or a minute in complete silence. He then handed it back to me and said, no one has ever put those ideas together in this way. And <laughs> promptly turned to talk to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so I was flattered and I may have blown his mind a little bit. Did and you leave him a copy of the book? Or? No, he handed it back to me. He wasn't interested in continuing the conversation. Uh, but this is one of the ways that I think the idea of a basic income can generate support from self-identified libertarians and conservatives and even folks who might have voted for Donald Trump in the last election. Oh, there it goes. Um, I got a, Sue Hansel says, my fear is that we will get UBI without LVT, so it would just be another Minji entitlement paid for by increasing the current unjust taxes. Most people advocating UBI have never heard of LVT. Um, that's, you're absolutely right. And one of my goals with the book is to educate the UBI supporters about LVT so that we don't fall into those traps. And that's one of the reasons that I hope the LVT supporters uh, will join me and other basic income proponents. Uh, I was starting to say earlier, uh, or maybe it was before we started the public chat, uh, Back in 2002, the Basic Income Network in the United States was formed in December of 99, <laughs> and we had a big conference in New York in 2002, and that year, the following year, uh, the Basic Income Network began having our conferences uh, hosted by the Eastern Economics Association. So they would take care of registration and all the details and give us a room, and we could just come and do our thing. And so from that first EEA conference in New York, <coughs> there were a lot of basic income proponents there and a lot of land value tax Georgia's people. And Jeffrey Smith, Gary Flo, Polly Cleveland, Alana Hartsock, uh, some of the folks from the Henry George School in Manhattan. And over the next couple of years, there was a nice coming together of our two groups uh, at least the more academically inclined folks in our two groups. And so I quickly began to joke that instead of two tiny little marginal political economic movements, we had one slightly larger marginal political movement. Um, but again, I think 
basic income is now the proverbial idea whose time has come and we're clearly in the political discourse. And one of my goals is to move both of our issues forward as rapidly as possible. And to, to extend Sue Hansel's concern, you know, the, the big problem is that the federal government doesn't actually have a, a, um, a mechanism to legally levy land value tax that, that various Supreme right. Court rulings have said that you can't, it, have ruled that it's a direct tax and that you would have to apportion the revenue, you apportion the burden by the state. And I think there are some workarounds in that how you distribute the burden. So if, if, you, if you did this on the federal level, you know, the tax rate for people in Alabama would be much higher than the tax rate for people in Connecticut. Um, because their land value is so high in Connecticut, they can have a lower tax, get the same per capita revenue. So maybe you would have to uh, boost that revenue or do some other revenue sharing, like um, a, a, as far as I understand, a royalty on uh, coal extraction or oil extraction is yeah, not a direct tax. Mm -hmm. And therefore you can use you can use that revenue to enhance, to offset the, the higher tax burden that Alabamans have. Um, and, and, or maybe they would just get, um, you know, all the money collected from Alabama could be given to Alabama. Well, ideally, I think that's what we want to move toward is that uh, there's some national basic income mm -hmm. and funded by some combination of national taxes on income, on extraction, on uh, consumption of other sorts, uh, and that local governments should primarily be funded from local land value taxes. And you were saying before, and there's a tendency to all or nothing kind of notions. And people think, okay, we're going to turn on the basic income and everyone's suddenly going to get a check for $1,000. Uh, that's not the way politics works. Ideas are iterative and we start with some version and we gradually integrate that and refine it. And uh, those refinements happen at all levels, local, state, and federal. And we'll see how things evolve. Okay, your your Cadi, I don't know what that means, um, or who that is. Um, can you give us some examples of amount of amount of taxes, dollar amount, for someone that is currently being charged a land value tax? I don't. It's. The, the pen, in the United States, the, the Pennsylvania cities have land value tax. I don't know that anybody else does, but the, the dollar amount is so variable at all. If you live in, if you live in the m most affluent neighborhood in Pittsburgh, um, even if you have a small lot, your land value tax is 85 times as high as someone who lives in a poor neighborhood in Pitt, poor, one of the poorest neighborhoods in Pittsburgh. Um, so I don't know that there's some amount that is that you can describe as typical. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know how to answer that question or to give any. And one of my strategies with the book actually is to finesse a lot of those details, especially where the details involve local policies. And I sincerely, truly, deeply believe in democracy. And one of the, my goals with UBI and land value tax and everything I present in the book is to engage people as citizens where they live in demanding more responsive and effective government. So that's how things will evolve. I got one that says, Rent collectors, once they sniff free money to consumers, will increase their rent. So your basic income achieves nothing of substance unless you protect against rent gouging. 
Does your plan include such a Georgia safeguard? Um, again, I think that notion, and I've heard it a lot from in different forms from Georgists and from non-Georgists, is that the landlords will just raise the rent. Uh, in theory, in macroeconomic terms, that might make sense. But in the real world, I don't think it's a serious problem. I mean, in the real world, tenants are going to, when the landlord comes and knocks at the door and says, I'm raising your rent, the tenants are going to say, screw you, I'm moving. And they might pool their basic incomes to buy property, to buy their own home, or they might move out to a rural area. And markets will function and uh, people will be empowered to demand uh, what is best for them and their families. So again, it, we tend to default to these kinds of abstract macroeconomic questions and concerns. And in the real world, I don't think that will happen at all. Well, um, yeah, it's, it's different if it happens locally than it is if it happens nationally. And the, the, there is a lot of history to show, like the state of Pennsylvania, every time welfare benefits increased, rents went up in poor neighborhoods. Yeah, and, and if um, landlords can get away with that. But yeah. again, basic income is much more than welfare and gives people direct political power that doesn't come with welfare. Yeah, and that's it, part of the argument for basic income is that it's treating all people, poor workers, middle class, upper class, as equal citizens in this one way at least, so we can begin to have more democratic conversations about uh, property and uh, taxes and so on. Yeah, there is there is an argument that if it's funded from land value tax, the landlord is in less of a position to um, strong arm the tenant. The, the, yes. the landlord, if there is a land value tax, the landlord has to fear the tenant moving out. But exactly. If there, but if there's no land value tax, the landlord can say, well, I'm raising the rent and if you move out, I'll let it sit vacant for a couple of months. Somebody will want it. And, you know, and it, it's oh. one of those things that the law of rent, there is, you know, there are, there are theoretical things that, that ring true, but they, that you have to take both sides. So if, if you have a land value tax funded from something else, land values might go up, should go up where the net recipients live, where the people who are getting a basic income that's much larger than the tax increase they're paying to fund the basic income, land values might go up for them. It might go down. In other words, land values in the rich neighborhoods might go down because the rich neighborhoods are where the rent recipients live. And the rent recipients might see their land values going down. And in the poor neighborhood, the land values are going up. To the extent that the poor neighborhood is absentee owned, it's kind of going back to those rich people in those rich neighborhoods. But um, but the real question is, if it's funded from a land value tax, you're promoting a higher intensive use. So as you say, people can pull. You know, if if you have a land value tax and you don't have restrictive zoning like DC has very restrictive height limits and stuff. So if you have a land value tax and you, um, and you attract new, newer, richer people, well, they can, they can build where there had been vacant land and they're not displacing anybody. Or they can build a 100 unit high rise where there had been six, um, freestanding houses. So they're adding a hundred families at the cost of displacing six families. And so they're creating a net increase in housing space, which makes overall housing more affordable, even if those new yeah. units are more expensive. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you mentioned Rick Rybeck earlier and uh, hopefully those new units will be near the metro or other mass transit and near schools and near workplaces and will reduce the reliance on cars and private roads and such. 
and these get into a whole range of issues of local zoning and local land value tax and uh, these concerns will be resolved over time in ways that I think will largely benefit most everyone. Mark asks, how is your new book different from your earlier book, Basic Income Imperative? Uh, thanks for the question, Mark. Uh, the new book has the same basic logic and structure, uh, but is greatly refined in many of the arguments. Uh, with the new book, I actually had an editor who was uh, the head of media relations in the White House under H.W. Bush. And I believe she was the highest uh, African-American woman in the H.W. Bush administration. So she was not a big basic income supporter when uh, we first met and she took on this project. I don't think she knew anything about the land value tax when we first met and she took on this project. So I've greatly refined the arguments uh, specifically around the land value tax and found many ways to present it much more clearly and directly so that regular folks, again, folks who might have voted for Trump or Bernie Sanders or might not have voted at all, will uh, more readily see the benefits of basic income and land value tax. Uh, one of the great challenges in rewriting that earlier book and refining my arguments was to have very carefully uh, phrase everything in a way that could win support from folks across the political spectrum. So I was quite deliberate in not saying anything hypercritical of Trump or of Bernie and always looking to frame my ideas in ways that could appeal to both of the supporters from both sides. So uh, lots of updates, lots of uh, the appendix one is a comprehensive history of related ideas and the new book uh, covers yes, three years and uh, many saw the I saw the new book had a lot of appendices in it. Um, There's four appendices. And what I worked very hard to do is to present the basic text as clearly and concisely as possible so that it's really a handbook for activists. So it's yeah. the vision, plan, strategies, tactics, and rhetoric that people can use in their campaigns, uh, campaigns for Congress, for mayor, for other offices and then moved uh, all of the more theoretical or academic material into the appendices and the end notes. So appendix one is a comprehensive chronological history of ideas related to basic income and of course includes Thomas Paine and Henry George. Appendix two is uh, where I include some numbers and other details about how we pay for the basic income and how it's readily affordable by cutting and simplifying current government programs that would become superfluous, eliminating corporate welfare, eliminating a lot of excess defense spending, which is corporate welfare to create jobs, uh, eliminating uh, direct programs that benefit individuals, but only when those programs become superfluous, if the basic income is adequate. Then Appendix 3 discusses the international ideas, and Appendix 4 is simply uh, resources for more information. And there's also a lengthy endnotes, which again is more academic material and more direct references. Uh, so yeah, I didn't that. that structure to make the core book very clear and simple and straightforward for activists to use in their campaigns. Yeah, I don't remember your older book being indexed. I might have been, but the new book is rather yeah. early indexed as well. Yeah, the older book was not indexed. Um, the new book, I had a very good indexer proofreader. In fact, at one point I asked her, uh, if there's special software she uses for her indexing. She's been a professional indexer for quite a few years. And I was just 
ter terrifically amused when she said she's tried various software uh, for that purpose and she found that all the software has flaws so she actually does her indexing on index cards huh. so yeah it's a very careful index and the two of us talked about it in detail to make sure that all the important points were covered okay um let's see did, did um steve says should we outlaw the tax exemption and the the um, well, what should we do about tax exemption? Georgists have always been against tax exemption. So some Georgists say even the post office should be paying local taxes. That way, the post office will not locate in the the most you know the highest value business location unless it has unless that's also the best place for a post office that. Uh, that everybody should pay taxes. Um, well, and I generally uh, take a somewhat libertarian view that I want to eliminate tax breaks and exemptions and subsidies of all sorts and make things as clean and clear and simple as we can. So again, I have in the chapter on taxes, chapter three, I specifically present uh, four tables combining the basic income with a negative with a flat income tax and show how the net effect is fair simple and inclusive uh, that's where i also suggest introduce the idea of the land value tax and argue for shifting property taxes off of buildings and onto land and for viewing that in the larger category of taxes on takings and my overall frame is that we can make government more small and simple and responsive and effective and efficient. And in that way, also make government much more local. Yeah, and, and that'll lead us to the next question. But first I wanted to say, I've always thought of, of things like voucher education to be, mo I don't see any index, anything about vouchers in your book. Um, uh, but voucher I discuss only briefly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but voucher education can, you know, we give money, we have an ethic that I agree with, which is that it's in the national interest that people be educated. But it's not in the national interest that the state should dictate what we learn. Because as a democracy, we need to be free to learn what we think is right, not be spoon fed what the state thinks is, we well, need and to know. That's exactly, and my argument about education, education is one of those big complex issues that arouses lots of emotional responses in the yeah. conventional discourse. And so my argument basically is that with basic income, parents, especially parents of poor and working families, parents will have greater power to be involved in their kids' education. And parents will perhaps decide that they want to homeschool their kids or that they want to be more active in the parent-teacher association or that they want to volunteer in the classroom to participate more directly. And today, of course, those opportunities are mostly unavailable for poor and working parents who are struggling so hard to pay their bills. So basic income empowers parents to make the decisions about educating their kids and themselves instead of defaulting to uh, interest groups that run charter schools or to school boards that are uh, heavily influenced by corporate funders or uh, government agents who think they know what's best for you and your family. Okay. And um, Mark again said, El this ties into what you were saying, uh, LVT is envisioned as a local tax. Basic income seems to be promoted as a federal program. Can you explain how Local LVT can be coordinated with a federal basic income program. Uh, that's a great question, and I sort of touched on it before, and I'm glad you brought me back to it, Mark. Mark, you got the two best praised questions. 
Uh, I've done enough uh, Zoom and other interviews with uh, this book and hope to do a great many more. But one of the things I've been learning is to flatter my questioners <laughs> and to make them feel good and to flatter my interviewers also. So you're doing a fine job, Dan. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, so what I envision... You're a terrible is, guest. <laughs> <laughs> ...is a national basic income of any amount. Maybe it's 300 or $500 to begin. Uh, maybe there's a smaller amount for children. Um, and then local governments could supplement that where necessary. Uh, as Mark and other, another caller raised, uh, land value tax is generally going to be mostly local and... I discussed that uh, as a way to empower and strengthen local democracy and local governments. Uh, there's a group that recently formed Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, uh, one of the most known uh, pilot projects for basic income right now is a privately funded experiment in Stockton, California, giving, uh, I think it's 125 families, $500 a month, it's now been running for almost two years and will run through at least the end of this year. And they're showing that those families are doing tremendously well, are much better off than uh, they would have been without that money. And so a new group has formed called Mayors for a Guaranteed Income. And there are now 15 or 20 or more mayors around the country calling for a national guaranteed income, and many of them are also saying that we should be able to supplement that amount locally. So I think local politics will become much stronger and more interesting, and that will generate uh, more support for the local land value tax and the shift away from uh, the current property tax on buildings. Yeah, I, I will, I, I just typed that on notepad so I can look it up when we're done. Um, yeah, the website, I think, is Mayors for a GI, uh, but Mayors for a Guaranteed Income. We'll find it, yeah. Um, James Fredrickson asked, um, have you calculated the cost of a universal basic income vis-a-vis -vis the um, cost of, a current, of all current poverty programs that are funded by various levels of government? Um, in, again, in Appendix 2, I include some of those calculations, and quite happily for me, uh, I'm able to quote from two uh, authorities who are on opposite ends of the political spectrum. So Charles Murray is a renowned libertarian, and he wrote a book calling for a basic income. Uh, he first published it in 2006 and then revised it in 2016. And he has detailed cost analysis of the programs that can be cut and uh, how we can easily afford a basic income just by cutting existing programs. Uh, then I also cite from Andy Stern, former head of the Service Employees International Union, who published a book in 2016 calling for a guaranteed income, a basic income. And he also does detailed cost calculations and. His numbers are particularly nice because he was on the Simpson-Bowles Commission appointed by President Obama and so really has some budgetary expertise. And again, both of them show that basic income is readily affordable uh, through cutting the programs that become superfluous. And if we add in ideas about land value tax and other reforms, uh, there's no question that we can make this work. Yeah, there, I think it's Andrew Stern wrote an excellent uh, article about basic income versus a jobs guarantee. And it's um, one of the points that I really emphasize is that the whole conventional discourse about jobs uh, has some very questionable assumptions, I think completely flawed assumptions. Uh, and I always start with the core democratic principles from the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and say government's duty is to help people affect their safety and happiness. Government's duty is to protect our unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The idea of jobs 
uh, became so prominent in the political discourse in the Great Depression, where under the Roosevelt administration, government was redefined to be the employer of last resort. And in the Great Depression, government was creating jobs directly. Government was hiring artists and actors and writers and photographers to make art, paying them to make art. Over the next few decades, and especially starting in the late 70s and the 80s, government, instead of uh, providing jobs directly, became the promoter of the private sector. And that's when we fell into all these patterns of corporate welfare uh, and of jobs guarantees. And, uh, and with basic income, I think we can get back to the core values and say, you know, give people a basic income. People will figure out what's best for themselves and their families. People will be able to manage their life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then we can get government out of the business of creating any sort of jobs. Because when government is creating jobs, it's interfering in markets. It's uh, distorting private sector activities. And I don't want government to be doing that. And, and I think our conservative and libertarian friends uh, ought to embrace basic income for exactly that reason. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that a lot of Marxists hate the basic income and want a jobs guarantee. And um, I always said, you know, there's the only place I know of where everyone is guaranteed a job is slave plantations and communist countries. <laughs> and, and that might not actually be two separate categories. So, you know, so I have a real problem with the jobs guarantee. Um, but I think it was Andrew Stern. That I have a bookmark somewhere, but I don't have, I don't have my, uh, my web browser up because, because I didn't want to eat bandwidth. Um, but it, he had a really detailed analysis of why a jobs guarantee was inferior. And part of it was some people are not capable of, of doing the job. Some people will require so much supervision that, that it's actually, if the supervisors just did the work themselves, it would be more productive than having the supervisors dealing with people who yeah. are, are, are either incompetent or, or socially maladjusted that, that they aren't fit for doing that work. And a basic income gives them enough you know, one of the things is you can actually lower the minimum wage by 50 cents for every dollar you add to basic income. So um, my father had his own business and there was a guy who had, um, what's a mad cow disease, Jakob Kreitzfeld. There was a guy who, who walked from business to business with a dust broom, one of those nice <laughs> big wide things. And he walked into the store every day and just and he he was so far gone he had the shakes and everything he was so far gone that he couldn't pick up chairs to sweep under them and stuff so if i was there i'd move the chairs and stuff but he came through once a day and swept and my dad would give him a buck or two and then he'd go yeah. next door and they'd give him a buck or two and that's how traditional societies functioned with the people who had such uh, yeah. special needs and so, if, so if the basic income is inadequate to provide for a person like that, that person is incapable of getting a job that will earn minimum wage. But he is capable of going from store to store and, and getting exactly. some pocket change and stuff on top of his basic income. So, well, and it's not just the pocket change and someone like that probably finds meaning in going from store to store and doing yeah. that sweeping and having those social interactions. Yeah, and that again like is he... why basic income is so important because it directly empowers each individual to pursue meaningful work instead of coercing people into taking a job because they need the money. Um, Hasn't basic income been implemented with the twelve hundred dollar checks to all uh, to nope. all taxpayers? The uh, it's not quite a basic in income. It's an emergency basic income, 
Um, but obviously it's not recurring, it's not universal, it's not unconditional. Um, interestingly, uh, the first time government distributed a check to all taxpayers was in 2001 as part of the first Bush administration tax cut. Yes. And that idea, I have this in appendix one of the book, uh, that idea was proposed by the progressive caucus in the House, uh, liberal Democrats, say we should just distribute money directly. Was that $750 or something? No, that first one was $300 for every person, $600 for a couple, uh, but it was watered down. So the House version from the progressive Democrats was universal and unconditional, uh, but one time only. However, they wanted to repeat it every year if surpluses continued. And that was back in 2001, there was uh, a mild recession uh, from a bursting of the tech bubble and there was a government surplus at the time. And so uh, George W. Bush and the Republicans wanted uh, tax cuts skewed primarily to the wealthier taxpayers and the progressive Democrats wanted this direct distribution and so the compromise was a one-time distribution only to people who paid income tax. So it didn't help the very poor. But then again in 2008, I think that time it was $750. And again, that was under the George W. Bush administration. Mm -hmm. uh, that housing bubble burst and that recession was just deepening. Uh, so this is the third time we've had a direct distribution. And it looks like it's going to happen again, another $1,200, but it's still one time only, and it's not truly universal because there will be cutoffs. And my point is that in terms of our ongoing economic security, in terms of strengthening our democracy, in terms of empowering individuals uh, directly, uh, it would be much better to have a small distribution that goes to everyone and happens monthly. So even if it's $400 or $500 a month, you will know that you can plan on that. You will know that you will be getting it not just this month, but next month and the month after and next year. So people can begin to make long-term decisions for themselves and their families. Okay, uh, Mark says, those who are disadvantaged by our system of privatized commons need more than $100 a month, reducing the initial amount for everyone, including the poor. <coughs> so millionaires can also get their equal meager amount seems to be adding insult to injury. Uh, well, I'm again, what I want to do is eliminate all the tax breaks and subsidies that are currently going to the millionaires. So the wealthy will end up uh, paying much more than they do today. And I hope the basic income will be much more than $100 a month. And yeah, there will be in equities and perceived injuries, especially in the transition period in the early months. And we all know that most of us are risk averse and we tend to default to the status quo and to resist new ideas and, uh, and the first paragraph of Thomas Paine's pamphlet, Common Sense, he noted that a long habit of not seeing that things are unjust gives them the superficial appearance of being right and raises at first a formidable outcry in defense of custom. And I think that's true with regard to the tax code and regard to the many injustices in our society is that there's a formidable outcry against anyone who's trying to change the system. And certainly the Georgists know that from the history of how Henry George's ideas were perceived and attacked and how the mayoral election in New York was stolen by the Tammany Hall Democrats. So uh, Payne then in that first paragraph goes on and says, but the tumult soon subsides, time makes more converts than reason. And yeah. my experience with basic income is that the more people think about it, the more they realize over time that this really does make sense and that we really ought to move in this direction. And I think that's also true with the land value tax. If we can just get people to pause and think clearly and directly and personally, people will 
soon agree that these ideas make sense and we ought to begin implementing them rapidly. Yeah, and I always say a small success is better than a big failure. So Absolutely. Any so small success can be built upon toward a greater yeah. success. So getting $100 a month or is, you know, is a stepping stone toward getting $200 a month, but but getting the rejection of $1,000 a month is a stepping stone toward getting another rejection next year. That's um, Ed Dodson says, everyone might be interested to know that our Australian colleague, Phil Anderson, has a new book available for a free ebook download called Your Citizen's Dividend. He has created a pr Facebook page to promote the subject. So, That's great. Um, and one of the things that I have been doing from my book in 1998, and I continue in this one, is I use the term citizen dividend interchangeably with universal basic income. Uh, the idea of UBI is that it's universal and unconditional, but in practical political terms, I think there would be overwhelming demand to restrict it only to citizens. And I think if we call it a citizen's dividend, uh, we can generate more political support from people who identify as conservatives and people who are specifically concerned about immigration related issues. And I then go on to suggest that uh, our policy with regard to immigrants, especially those on the southern border who are coming from the devastated countries, uh, devastated by climate change and by American policies and by oligarchs, uh, we ought to encourage Mexico and Guatemala and El Salvador and all other countries to implement some version of a basic income. And indeed, we ought to redirect whatever American foreign aid is going to those countries toward helping them implement some version of a basic income at whatever level is appropriate. So the book goes from the immediate concerns of American citizens to issues of foreign policy and international policy. I even include a ideas about basic income to promote peace in the Middle East. So any issue you care about, I discuss it at least briefly and... Um, um, Mike Curtis, I think we answered this. Mike Curtis asked, why wouldn't the UBI just let, raise land rent for non-landowners? And um, where there's a little bit of lag behind between the when the question's asked and when I see it. But um, yeah, I think, I think we cover that. And I think the general agreement is that there would be some increase at least if it's not funded from a land value tax. But if, if it's funded from a land value tax, it should drive rents down. Um, yeah, I think that's right. And again, during the transition, there will be these sorts of concerns and we're going to have to address them. And that's one of the reasons that I hope uh, Georgists and basic income supporters can all work together to achieve the most just outcomes over time. Um, Mark asks, is there a political future for the UBI Andrew Yang Alliance? I believe there's a huge political future and uh, my friends in the Yang Gang and the UBI networks are working with many candidates. I'm actually consulting with several basic income candidates for Congress uh, who have a real chance of being elected this year. Where does Yang uh, live? New York. Okay. Uh, so uh, there are a number of uh, basic income supporters already in I'm Back in 2017, I actually met uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez when she was first launching her campaign and talked to her about basic income. And uh, she often mentioned it in her stump speeches when she was first running for office. And she's now talking about it again. Uh, there are a dozen or more candidates for Congress right now, some of whom still have primaries, some of whom have already won their primaries and will be in the general election, who are talking about basic income. And 
Uh, one of my goals with the book is to, and with my consulting, is to provide them with the tools to win those elections so that we can have a viable uh, UBI caucus in Congress uh, in January. And again, particularly because of the emergency payments that we got a few months ago and that we may be getting again next month, uh, I think there's a strong interest in basic income, at least on an emergency basis, and ideally leading to some ongoing true UBI, and that that can happen within the next year. I, um, I, I was thinking, what, the reason I asked where he lived is that maybe Andrew Yang's next step could be to run for a city or state office. That, uh, uh, there was some talk about him possibly running for mayor, though. There's now a lot of talk about him running for president again in 2024. And every time I hear that, my immediate response is, I don't want to wait till 2024. I want to have a basic income within the next year or two or three, because the problems in our society are so wide ranging and so devastating and so rapidly becoming worse uh, yeah. that I think we need to implement this kind of reform as soon as possible. Well, I was thinking he could run for state legislature and start introducing things at the state level where land value I don't taxes. think he's interested in that. He wants to be an executive. Uh, okay. And he comes from an entrepreneurial background, and he wants an executive position, so. Okay. Um, how can we assist... I applaud you for trying to launch a Georgist infiltration of the basic income movement. <laughs> How can we assist your project further and also discuss it with you further? Um, thank you, whoever asked that question. Uh, you can assist it further, obviously, by buying my book and encouraging other people to buy my book. Uh, it is on Amazon. Uh, I'm putting up a website, which is ourfutureubi.com. So it's ourfutureubi.com. And the book is there, and the ebook is there, and uh, you can contact me through the website. Uh, and uh, I'm eager to work with all of you. Uh, again, it's educating the basic income community about the importance of land value tax, and uh, at the same time, educating the Georgist community about how to be more effective politically by presenting our ideas directly and clearly. And I was at your conference in Pittsburgh last year, last summer, and had a number of really great conversations with Josh Vincent and Rick Ryback and other folks who were engaged in immediate political projects. I can't recall his name at the moment, but the fellow from Puerto Rico. Um, so we are in a time when new ideas are becoming acceptable simply because the problems in our society are just so vast and the situation is so unsustainable. I had a friend back in Santa Barbara, Jeff and Gary both knew, uh, Bob Fitzgerald. I mentioned him in the acknowledgments of the book. And Bob was kind of a professional mentor, a uh, real systems thinker and rigorous policy person a uh, good friend, he had been close friends with Buckminster Fuller and with Bucky's daughter, Allegra. And when Bob helped me a lot with first formulating these ideas and including the Georgist aspects, and Bob would sometimes say that, you know, things often have to get worse before people will make a change. And boy, oh boy, and he would rub his hands like this. And he would say, <laughs> boy, oh boy, things really are getting worse. And that was true 20 years ago, and it's even more true today. And I think we're on the cusp of uh, radical change. And one of the books I mentioned in Appendix 1 is Buckminster Fuller's book, Utopia or Oblivion. And Bucky talked about ideas similar to basic income. And I really believe that we are at that tipping point, that we can either begin to consciously move toward a world that works for everyone, or we will collapse into something that nobody would ever choose and that even the wealthiest oligarchs 
will be harmed by. Okay, this one, this one's from Mike Curtis. It's, it's not super long, but it says, it, but it's theoretical. Um, rent wages and interest are determined by the margin, which is the free land. In the absence of free land, all the benefits minus the detriments that attach to any parcel add to the value of land. A cash dividend adds to the value of land. Um, but in the aggregate, the cash dividend is taken from somebody and it subtracts the value of land that they might want. Um, land value taxation increases the number of jobs and units of houses, but unless it creates free land, it doesn't raise wages or lower rents. Um, I think that's overstated, but we'll go on. The logic says the UBI will increase the benefits, therefore, like an increase in minimum wage or an increase in welfare, it will go to the landlords. In the case of people who own the land on which they work and live, they will get the benefits because they're renting them themselves. Alaska is a model of these principles. I assume he's saying that people are more willing to live in Alaska because the the dividend attracts people who might not otherwise be willing to live I in Alaska. I don't think there's any evidence of that. I Alaska, I, the good that you mentioned Alaska, Mike. So yeah, Alaska does have a small version of a basic income. It's the Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend. Uh, it was implemented in 1982. There's the money comes. There's 16 references to it in your index, so that's <laughs> I just noticed. I that. absolutely, it's a topic of discussion at every basic income uh, conference around the world. Uh, so every Alaska resident uh, receives a check each year from oil royalties, and uh, so it's a true basic income, though the amount is variable. It paid out every year. And I don't think there's any evidence that people choose to live in Alaska uh, just for the permanent fund dividend. Uh, there is, however, a great deal of evidence that it has improved quality of life for Alaska residents. And with all the talk in recent years about income inequality, Alaska is the state with the lowest inequality. And that's mainly and perhaps entirely because the permanent fund is distributed to everyone and the very poor are significantly better off. Um, you know, one of the, um, one of the things that, that there's a general principle that, that rent gets all the surplus. There are other factors like people can choose to um, if, if land becomes more expensive, but you're getting a dividend, there's the, there's the effect of saying, well, I'm going to use less land so that I can employ yeah. my dividend somewhere else. And then the question is, if I employ my dividend by buying a car, am I driving up the rent of Detroit land or am I <laughs> driving up the, 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 the cost of minerals that are used to make that car. Well, and again, gets... that's part of my argument for extending the concept of land value tax to the general uh, idea of taxes on takings. So we should tax whatever people take from the earth, uh, rare earth materials, steel, timber, salmon, and so on, or consuming electromagnetic spectrum or polluting uh, natural uh, environments. And so it becomes more expensive to consume and there will be a general or, and I hope relatively rapid shift toward emphasizing quality of life and reducing the quantity of consumption, the quantity of stuff that we take from nature. And uh, when I was writing my first book back in 98, I actually, in the end, discussing this I suggested that look around at your home uh, and all the stuff that you see in your home, the books and pots and pans and computers and everything else is post nature and pre landfill. And if we really want to improve our quality of life for ourselves and future generations, we have to reduce that three throughput. Now, of course, everyone should buy my book and <laughs> they can download it as the ebook and therefore not consume anything more than a few electrons. But 
generally, and I hope relatively soon, we have to shift toward an ethic that emphasizes quality of life and not quantity of stuff. And as part of that, we need to shift the way we measure consumption and the way we measure economic activity and get away from GDP, which is truly a gross indicator and devise indicators that are much truer to our uh, human well-being and environmental well-being over time. So all of these issues come together and if we begin to think in terms of the larger system dynamics, I think people will readily see that this idea of a universal basic income funded through a land value tax uh, can be the most powerful point of leverage to make these huge transitions that are so necessary. And if you don't want to end this conversation, I will note that we're at 90 minutes already. And again, I welcome people contacting me individually through ourfutureubi.com and maybe you or Sue have some final comments. Well, um, let me skip through because some of them of people who have been yeah. uh, speaking a lot. Um, I'm going to speak while he sets up stuff and say that I'm going to sign off early because I have to prepare for another meeting yet. And Comcast is deciding it's not going to behave with me, ladies and gentlemen. So I apologize for chat. I want to thank Steve for coming aboard. I want to thank Dan and remind people that um, on Tuesday is our final session where we will have our Economic Justice Award our um, and farewell. Uh, we will be honoring people like Mason Gaffney, uh, like a little boy named Miles Miller, who is the newest of the Georgia's kids. So uh, if you want an invite, please, I did put my email into chat. Have a great afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Bye. Thanks, Sue. Bye, Sue. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm ready to be done, Dan. So if <laughs> there are other questions, they can contact me directly. And when I do these talks, I sit on a hard stool because I find that it keeps me more mobile and focused. <laughs> okay. And so I'm ready to get up from my hard stool and walk around. Okay. Um, the, there was one more of a comment. Of, do you have a comment about modern monetary theory in connection? Sure, with I'll basic briefly do that. And I don't like the term modern monetary theory. I think it is a distraction from what is really being talked about. But Stephanie Kelton and the other MMT theorists, Michael Hudson, and uh, I think they're absolutely right. And government can create money as necessary. And one of the common objections to a basic income is people immediately say, oh no, we can't do that, it will cause inflation. Well, the MMT argument is no, government can create money and government does create money. And we, if we use it effectively, uh, that doesn't necessarily cause inflation and can promote uh, long-term benefits. And one of the points, again, getting back to my analysis of the flaws in conventional political discourse, is that too often uh, in politics, people don't make a clear distinction between investing and spending. Uh, and what Stephanie Kelton and other MMT proponents do very usefully is they say, you know, when you're investing in things that really promote well-being for individuals and for society, that's an appropriate and an important use of society and we can readily afford that. And we measure investments in terms of their long-term return. Mm. Uh, giving tax cuts for the rich and just encouraging mindless consumption and tax cuts for uh, airlines and for the hotel industry and for uh, extractive resource use, uh, that's spending and we should not be encouraging that. So let's cut all that stuff. So I briefly mentioned MMT in one of my end notes, mentions, so I quote Stephanie Kelton in that end note. 
And I think her arguments and mine are entirely compatible. Though she does not fully endorse the basic income, she still thinks government should be involved in a jobs guarantee of some sort, and hopefully will win her over relatively soon. Yeah, um, I work with a group called the Alliance for Just Money, and um, they have, they have, uh, I have a, a page on, on my uh, thing called uh, Henry George's Monetary Views. It's on uh, savingcommunities.org slash docs, um, D-O-C-S for documents. And um, Henry George was asked, because Henry George was a greenbacker. He believed that government should create all the money and the banks should not create money. They should yeah, and that's money modern money. monetary theory. Yeah, well, <laughs> except that... Except that uh, the modern monetary theory people de-emphasized the need to curtail bank creation of money. Yeah, and, and, and one of the other points that I mentioned briefly is the idea of public banks. And yeah. I'm sure there are many people in the Georgia's communities who endorse the concept of a publicly owned banks, state or local, uh, like the current Bank of North Dakota. And a public bank, local or state, uh, would be an excellent vehicle for facilitating a local or state basic income. Yeah, my my problem was that that so, uh, Ellen Brown wrote a thing that suggested yes. that we could entire fund a basic income of a thousand dollars a month per person entirely from new money, which which I as I went through that I I thought that that was extreme and absurd because it would require a three trillion dollar increase in the money supply every year, which is way beyond. Yeah, what, but you what fund it with new money, and then you adjust the tax code to pull that money back money out back of the system out. in the places where it. Yeah, but then you're ultimately so, funding it with whatever that tax is. Yeah, and uh, and my my thing is. Um, the Henry George said, I'm a greenbacker, I'm not a fool. And so, because somebody <laughs> asked him, do you think government can just create, just create massive amounts of money? And he said, no, I, I, but, but whatever it's created. So I look at, at MMT proposals as something that would be good to supplement, you know, that whatever new money, whatever new money should come into the system should come in as a basic income. Yes, or at least absolutely. come in as cuts on taxes and productivity. Or, yeah, or and again, the core point that I emphasize throughout the book, whoops, and right. the careful way that I book and present my arguments, is to always emphasize the importance of empowering individuals as citizens, empowering individuals to make the decisions for ourselves and our families and our communities and not getting caught up in abstract arguments about inflation or MMT or the money supply or the economy or the market or any of these conventional terms. And, and that's why I think basic income is so important and that's why I'm confident that as we move toward a basic income, hopefully in the next year or two, uh, we will also generate widespread support for land value tax and general taxes on takings so okay well then uh that's a good good place to end anyhow is because the principles are it's always good to start with the fundamental principles and end with the fundamental principles yes i agree and uh once again the book is our future um and it is on amazon steve schafferman is the it's also, if you go to the publisher, uh, for any of you who are involved with organizations, uh, you can contact the publisher directly and buy quantity books in bulk uh, to distribute for your organizations to help them mount their campaigns. And uh, you can contact me through Our Future UBI. Uh, and at the website, you can also order the books, ebook and hardcover. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, this has been really fun, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, once again, this is uh, made possible by support from the Robert Schalkenbach Foundation, the Foundation for Economic Justice, 
Common Ground USA, Earth Sharing Associates, and the Henry George Institute and individual donors. Thank you, everybody, and uh, I'll see you next time.